This is Polyamory Weekly, episode 33 for November 7th, 2005. Coming up on this week's show, Heinlein, yeah, couldn't avoid it. Labels, writing erotica, and a special interview with BDSM and poly-friendly author Stephen Elliott. All coming up on this week's show. Well, hello and welcome to Polyamory Weekly. For our under-18 age listeners, this is an adult-oriented podcast about really lascivious things like communication and honesty in relationships with some sci-fi thrown in. If you're under 18 and looking for upfront advice and answers to questions about sex, please visit scarletteen.com and turn off your iPod now. For everyone else, this is Polyamory Weekly, Tales from the Front of Responsible Non-Monogamy from a Pansexual Kink-Friendly Point of View. I am your host, Minx, and uh, whew, a couple of things going in. Um, first of all, I am coming to you very late at night from a hotel room in Madison where I am on a shoot and am very tired and very naked. <laughs> If the uh, if this show isn't edited as well as it normally would be, it's because, well, I'm really lucky I have time to do a show at all this week. So please be patient with me. Uh, but let's dive right in. Um, first of all, first off, in the mailbag, Vannevar Morgan wrote in about, you guess it, Robert Heinlein and the idea of labels. I really tried to avoid talking about Heinlein, but you know what? We should probably just do an entire podcast about people writing in about Heinlein's ideals and what they think. Let's just get it out of the way. But anyway, for now, he um, suggested uh, David Weber and Laurel K. Hamilton as uh, more poly-friendly authors. I've only read one. I read a Laurel K. Hamilton novel and just could not stand her writing style at all. Anyway, but he writes, I mostly like Heinlein, but what I dislike about his view of Polly and like about the other two is that Heinlein assumes that society becomes magically enlightened and Polly becomes the norm. I rather doubt that will happen in the next thousand years. And I'm not going to say anything about that. <laughs> I have my own views of Heinlein, uh, not all of which, some of which are positive, some of which are negative, but. Again, it's late, tired, don't feel like getting into the debate. We'll pick that topic up later. He says, I also disagree with your own interpretation of your very insightful comment. Labels are for other people's convenience. So using your own lovely example, self-identifying as booby sexual doesn't particularly help you understand your sexual appetites, but it helps me understand your frame of reference. While the map is not the territory, it's much easier to get somewhere in the wilderness if you have a map. We just need to keep the difference in mind. I think I understand what you're trying to say is that by, even though the label is for your convenience, by my sharing with you the label that I am most comfortable with, by my sharing with you what I have created, the label that I've created, then I am giving you a little bit more information about myself. So I, I guess that makes sense. Look at that. So non-controversial. Moving right along. Uh, Bad Snake wrote in about rejection. And she says, uh, Minx, instant expert, wrote in that it's more tricky than just saying no thanks to turn down an undesired advance when you're poly. But he doesn't say what he thinks an appropriate al alternate response would be. The only ones I can think of are yes or maybe, and those would be either dishonest or misleading. And actually, if I can insert here, I think he was thinking more in terms of his being the one asking people out and making that person uncomfortable. And I think... I sort of approached it more from the response end. So again, trying not to put words in his mouth. But she continues, if you're polyamorous, you need to be able to use a confident, nice no, and understand that no just means no. It doesn't mean I don't like you, I reject I reject you, or you're not good enough for me. Handing out maybes doesn't mean uh, that you don't mean, or worse, convincing yourself that you need to play with people you don't really want to play with may spare someone's feelings in the short run, but will cause horrible festering problems in the long run, including the loss of trust that you mean what you say. I suppose some might be tempted to lay out a lot of blow-softening diplomacy when they say no, but if someone's turning me down, I find a simple no thanks shows the most respect for my feelings and maturity. And I, I actually really agree with that. I have had people say no thank you, and I've actually had uh, on one occasion someone that I went out with a few times and, you know, I knew he was, we were dating. I wasn't really poly at that time, but he was dating someone else. And, um, 
it was it was very off and on and and you know at some point we it was more off and I was like okay so we're not really dating anymore or whatever it was fine and then you know we called got together out of the blue and he was giving me all kinds of signals so I just asked him I said you know are we on what's what's going on I thought we were kind of off it's okay either way I just want to know what's going on do you want to you know do you want to date again do you want to sex have sex do you want to fuck and you know he just looked at me and said well you know that girl I told you about yeah I'm going after her and he's like you know I like you but not that much I like her more and I really want to focus on her <laughs> and I was like okay cool I mean I you know I so appreciated the honesty the complete honesty about you know here's where you stand with me and I suppose if I'd been madly in love with him or something like that it probably would have hurt like hell but you know I'm with you bad snake just a, a polite no thanks I think that really shows respect all around. Mark wrote in about poly living arrangements and going in non-rosy. He wrote, I really like the thread of poly living situations, not one you see talked about a lot, but man, is it a big and complicated one. Every situation is different, though there are archetypes that pop up and possibly even matching solutions. I know a number of people that are in similar situations to the one you mentioned, being too territorial for something live in. Oftentimes, the solution to that one is, well, it just worked, contrary to all of our better judgments. <laughs> In my case, I'm living with two very strong-willed, very alpha females. I am what is referred to in the greater poly community as an idiot. <laughs> when it first became apparent that we'd be doing the cohabitation thing, we figured it would probably end up as the feature on one of those true crime shows on the Discovery Channel. But for reasons unknown, it just clicked and stayed clicky. I like the idea of going in saying, I mean, I, I don't want to be too pessimistic, pessimistic, but going in saying, yeah, it'll be a miracle if this works. Eh, we'll just give it a try. We'll give it a go. We'll see what happens. And it, I kind of like that attitude. I mean, not to say that you shouldn't like set your rules and do all your com communication and all of that, but I kind of like going in saying, huh, yeah, <laughs> this probably won't work, but eh, let's see what we can do. And I, I just like that. I kind of like that, you know, kind of take the pressure off a little bit. Maybe that's just me. And uh, we also have this audio comment, rock on, and guess what? It's from Australia. Here's Paul and Sauron. Hello, Mix. This is Paul and So Ren. Hello. Our, uh, your Australian friends. We thought we'd send you a audio comment so you can hear our lovely Australian accents. No, I do not know Steve Irwin. <laughs> he is a douchebag. <laughs> and all the other people, like... Uh, Rupert Murdoch, um, Paul Hogan, the, Greg Norman, you know, the Australians who are so loud and obnoxious, they become Americans in the end, so they're your problem, not ours anymore. <laughs> 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 On to more serious, well, notes. Thank you very much for your show. It's been very useful for us in the last little while as I'm discovering more about me. Yes, it's given us a little bit more perspective. Yes, well, I thank you also to the guy from this week's number 31... 32. I think, 32? Yeah. yeah. The 32 number of Poly Weekly for giving me those links to Australian sites. I had already come across the Poly Oz one, and I had made posts there, but I reason I said it was quiet is because I've heard nothing back so far. But anyway, I have also used the Poly Percolations. There's a lot of good reading on that one. Right, what's the address for that one? Um, uh, That's a good question? It's a good question. Mix will know <laughs> that one. She's, he's the sponsor. Ah, of course. Um, there's something here that Paul, that uh, Paul really wanted to say, but it's true for me as well, because this is one of those things that we've been talking about together and kind of realising at, almost at the same time. And um, it just says... Uh, that uh, a lot of the time you get told that if you truly want, if you, the only way to truly love someone else is you need the ability to love yourself first. Um, Paul has, has been talking to me about being poly for a while now and it's taking a little while to sink in, sink in and I'm not kind of warming to it. I, I don't think as fast as you would like. But um, I came across the different viewpoint that we're already in poly relationships, in a poly relationship with ourselves.
because we are discovering self-love and at the same time experiencing love for each other. So that's loving more than one person at once. <laughs> <laughs> it seems va- seemed valid to me. Indeed. I thought it was very good. <laughs> anyway. And also getting a way of getting around a sticky situation of having to uh, confront Polly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. One more thing. We thought we'd read our vows that we exchanged for our hand fasting last year. Which was a year and two days ago. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Yay for us. <laughs> Here we go. You or me? Both of us. Okay. In the, In the presence, presence of the spirits, spirits ancestors, and, and all those dear, dear to us, I make this promise to you and all, to live with you in love, to learn of you and myself, to help with your troubles when needed, to ask for help when needed, to appreciate time together and time apart, may we grow as individuals and as a couple, may we overcome our troubles and turmoils. Yeah. Yes. It, and... That worked for us. (laughs) Indeed. And hopefully it will continue to work for us. Yay! We are planning on being married next spring. That's September for us in Australia. Sorry, your autumn. (laughs) Fall, is it? Yes, autumn. (laughs) (laughs) I'll be a stubborn Australian. Anyway, love the show. Uh, Thank you very much. I'll be listening for a long time yet. Bye. Yes, thanks. Bye. And by the way, the site that they mentioned is from our very first sponsor from last week's show, which is available at polyamory.lucerella, L-U-C-E-R-E-L-L-A dot com. And um, thanks so much to Sauron for the comments about loving yourself first. Um, Really, you know, really appreciate that. And thank you so much, both of you, for sharing your vows. I I listened to this, your audio comment, and that part was completely surprised me and really, you know, almost brought a tear to my eye. Thank you so much for sharing that. And on to something much more goofy. Uh, Melissa and Brandon of The M&B Show were kind enough to provide and set up the Poly Weekly Frapper Map. And this is available at www.frapper.com forward slash polyamory weekly. And all it is is you type in, you know, your name or nickname or whatever and your zip code. Or I guess if you're in another country, I'm not sure what you type in. And then it gives you a little dot on the map. It's kind of like this Google map. And you can like put in a photo or a little message, a shout out, whatever. And I got a kick out of it because I'm like, ooh, I want to see those little pins in, you know, Australia and Germany and, you know, China and Mexico. And, of course, right now, the last time I checked anyway, all the pins were in the United States. But there's one little pin in Germany. So if you're bored at work, <laughs> go to frappr.com forward slash polyamoryweekly and throw yourself on the map. Anyway, that's just for my own amusement, no obligation at all. And a few more things wanted to touch on before we get to the interview with Stephen Elliott. First of all, in her blog, Susie Bright, the infamous sexpert, whom I love, she was the one of the first people I heard talk about polyamory in her non-monogamy blowout, and um, I just love listening to her non-monogamy blowouts, and I just very distinctly in my early days of poly, trying to figure everything out. And I remember her saying, talking about jealousy and saying, it's okay that you want all the cookies, but it's not okay for you to have all the cookies. That just stuck out in my mind. (laughs) Anyway, oh, oops. Before I get to that, a really quick question, um, a a really quick comment. Aliska was kind enough to write in and say that she identified the Pope, the particular Pope that she thought that uh, men of Sin had written in about that died of seminal backup. Um, specifically, uh, she thinks it was John the Twelfth, and sent a link to a Wikipedia article, which is at wikipedia.org forward slash wiki forward slash pope underscore John XII. Uh, the manner of his death is uncertain, although it was rumored that John was murdered by a jealous husband whose wife had been discovered receiving the sexual affections of the Pope. And with that little tidbit, we move on to Susie Bright. So this is in reference to, available at susiebright.blogs.com, and I will give the specific link to, this is an article on writing, writing erotica, writing good erotica. 
and I was just so glad to see this. And of course, I'm not going to read the thing in its entirety, but I love this. Lesson number two. This is from How to Write a Dirty Story, sorry. And uh, the tip is lesson number two from page 83, a great erotic story never succumbs to cliches. So much nonsense is circulated about what is sexy that writers often hide their own preferences behind superficial hype or resort to genre chestnuts that are worn to the nub. Ugh, so true. And one of my favorite bits of advice, which says, love scenes are not operating instructions. Erotic scenes are acts of passion. You don't want to reduce body parts to a running diagram of measurements and traffic signals. Quote, licking my way three inches up her left knee, I felt her ejaculate spatter on my right cheek, end quote. This unerotic attention to the wrong details is what is shown as mechanical sex writing, and you want to rid yourself of the neurosis at its first showing. I have to say that's one of my pet peeves with erotica is when uh, there's this one author that I was reading on um, Literotica that I, I really liked his stories because they were to my own particular sexual taste, but I really had to ignore his writing style because he never referred to women's breasts like, you know, it was never, you know, her full and rounded breasts or her, her creamy white breasts that, you know, were perky and her nipples came to attention. No, he described breasts as her 32C breasts, her 32C breasts. And every single story he wrote, the only way he described breasts was by the freaking bra size. Oh, wait, it's a podcast. Was by the fucking bra size. And it really, really bugged me. Same, same way as it bothers me when I read erotica that's like, he fucked her this way. Then he flipped her over and fucked her this way. Then this guy came in her face. And then she went down to do this. And then he took her head and made her eat this other girl out. And then this. <laughs> Again. It's not operating instructions. Take a little time to tell us, you know, what the characters are thinking, what they're feeling, you know, describe what they're doing. Show, don't tell. Anyway, that's my own little rant that I added to Susie Bright's blog entry. However, I will provide the link to that story in the show notes at www.livejournal.com forward slash users forward slash polyweekly. I will warn you, I don't know when I'll be able to get to the show notes, so just be patient. It'll probably be a couple of days until the shoot's over before I actually have time to sit down and listen and do the show notes, so just be patient with me. One more quick topic before we get to the Stephen Elliott interview. Polly in the media. There was a, did you guys hear about this? Polygamous judge fights for his job at hearing. This was represented on or presented on uh, abcnews.go.com. And the headline is, Attorney Tells Utah Supreme Court That Judge With Three Wives Should Not Be Removed From be Bench. Judge Walter Steed speaks with the media after his case was argued before the Utah Supreme Court during a session at the J. Reuben Clark Law School on the Brigham Young University campus in Provo, Utah, Wednesday, November 2nd, 2005. Steed says his status as a polygamist should not be grounds for removing him from the bench. The State Judicial Conduct Commission issued an order seeking Steed's removal after a 14-month investigation deemed Steed was a polygamist. Steed's attorney argued during Wednesday's hearing that while drug abuse, for example, might be grounds for removal, Steed's private behavior in his home should not be. Hmm. Little tidbit on Polly in the media. And with that, we'll move on to our interview with Stephen Elliott. Now, Stephen Elliott, you may recall is the author of the story Three Men and a Woman from the New York Times. I think I referred to that at the beginning of the interview too, so bear with me on the repetition. And he's also the author of a book called Happy Baby. Now, I do want to apologize. I don't know why, but I did as much as I could, but the audio on Stephen's end um, came across as very garbled. I think when I tried to turn his volume up, that it became a little bit garbled. So uh, please, you know, listen as long as you can. Bear with me for the interview. And, um, well, here we go. Stephen Elliott. Well, we have with us in the studio today via Skype, Stephen Elliott. Say hello to everyone, Stephen. Hello. And Stephen, you may everyone. want to... <laughs> it is everyone. We have over a thousand listeners. Uh-huh. And Stephen, you may recall, is the author of Three Men and a Woman from the New York Times, the September 4th, that I referred to in a previous show. And um, since then, I referred to it as a fiction story, but Stephen, you're telling me that story is actually true. Is that correct? 
this nonfiction piece for the Modern Love column, which is, uh, you know, a memoir column written often by novelists, but it's always nonfiction. It just has a narrative feel to it because I write novels primarily, and so that's my style. Yeah, it did come across as fiction. So, Stephen, this is definitely a story of polyamory, and you're t talking about having a polyamorous girlfriend in a polyamorous relationship. Uh, are you actually poly? Uh, I don't really know <laughs> if I'm uh, polyamorous. Uh, I didn't really... When we we met, <clears throat> I hadn't put together she was married. Not that she had hidden that from me. I just didn't quite cognize it. And uh, so when we met and she started talking about her husband, I assumed that she was married but separated. And that was, of course, not the case. Uh, and then as I came to understand the relationship that she had, I thought, well, okay, she's doing this thing, and it's all above board, and nobody's lying to anybody else. Whatever mm -hmm. their deal is has nothing to do with me. So, uh, and I was very attracted to her, and I thought, okay, we'll have an affair, and, and that's fine. Um, but what happened instead was that I ended up falling in love with her, mm. and, we, and our relationship became very serious. And so then I had to uh, learn how to be in a polyamorous relationship and try to make it, uh, you know, a healthy, workable relationship. So it's more, it's not that I was trying to be polyamorous, but here I am in the poly relationship. She's happily married. Uh, I certainly don't want to, you know, mess with her marriage anyway. And so, you know, person if a person wants to, a person can learn <laughs> these things. I don't know if I'm going to uh, see other people, you know. I probably, I'll probably uh, play with other people at some point. But I don't, I don't really know if I'm polyamorous. I mean, mm -hmm. my... My fantasies tend to revolve around my girlfriend, mm -hmm. and so uh, I'm not really seeking to be in another relationship, I don't think. You know, we've talked about, uh, we talked before that uh, your sort of entry into polyamory mirrors mine in a lot of ways, and I think it's really interesting that you use the word affair when you talk about first being with her, that you just thought it was going to be this affair, and then you ended up falling in love. Which is exactly well, one of the things. <laughs> yeah, and one of the things there is that I hadn't fallen in love in like a, a very long time, mm -hmm. and most I, I meet a lot of women because I go on book tours and I teach classes and I just kind of am often meeting new people. So it's not like you know. I, usually, when I meet a woman that I like and we mess around or whatever, it doesn't really amount to a whole lot. So I wasn't expecting this to be any different. You know, how do you know? How do you know when you meet somebody that you can end up falling in love with them? I Absolutely. And I, I shared with you before that that's sort of what happened with me, that I met Grey Dancer, and I was like, oh, it's going to be this wild, crazy fling. And we ended up falling in love, and I had to learn how to be Polly. So I was sort of chuckling as you said that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So I take it, have you met her husband? Yeah, twice. Okay. And, and uh, it was fine. You know, it was just pretty, pretty okay. Pretty okay. <laughs> yeah, pretty okay. So, and how long has this re relationship been going on? Uh, so we've been together uh, four months now. Four months, okay. So not that long. But it's, you know, I spend, I see her like five days a week or four or five days a week. We spend, you know, probably 40 hours a week together. Uh, oh. It's actually, for me... It's by far the most serious and intense relationship I've had since I was engaged in my early 20s and probably probably quite a bit more serious than that. Uh, it's the healthiest relationship I've ever had. <laughs> so um, how do you deal with loving. that? How do you deal with that, mm -hmm. having this new polyamorous thing be the healthiest and most intense relationship you've had in, you know, what, 10 years? Well, I mean, she's between jobs, so... And going back to school, so she has some extra time. Uh, I'm between books, and I have a little more time than I normally would, so we will spend a lot of time together. Um, she's incredibly sexually open, and we're we're pretty heavily into BDSM. Mm -hmm. And 
but we do it in a much healthier way than I usually do, which is that I've had a lot of healthy BDSM relationships where, because uh, I'm submissive and, and they've been very punishment-focused, and this is more like, okay, I want you to do this because I love you or take this pain for me, and so it's always, rather than punishment, it's more reward-based. Um, and it's so open, openly affectionate uh, that it actually it just feels very healthy. We 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 connect on a lot of uh, intellectual levels, and um, and the polyamory thing, the fact that she's married, is just kind of this side thing. It's not a relationship in any way. So I'm glad you brought that up. Let's talk about the BDSM. <laughs> Now, I know that not all of our listeners are kinky, but I there's definitely a very strong relationship between polyamorous people and BDSM. I mean, you even mentioned that yeah. you might play with other people, and I assume you're talking about scening in BDSM scenes, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So how yeah, for me, uh, that's my only sexuality. I'm only in the BDSM. I don't, I don't do straight stuff. You characterize your relationship with uh, your girlfriend as surprisingly healthy with respect to BDSM. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit more? Well, I mean, it's surprisingly healthy in a lot of ways just because I've not had many good, rela good romantic relationships uh, for any number of reasons. Mm -hmm. And relationship BDSM has been very unhealthy a lot of times because I had a hard time. I grew up as a ward of the state in mm -hmm. group homes and... So homes with lots of children, and they were very violent, and they were not particularly accepting of alternative sexuality. Uh, and so it took me a long time to come out of the closet about uh, being a submissive. Um, and so oftentimes I would go looking to have an S&M interaction with someone, and I wouldn't practice safe, sane, and consensual. I would go home with anybody uh, I would get burned with cigarettes. I would end up in scenes where nothing was negotiated and there were no safe words. And I basically put myself in some dangerous situations and sometimes uh, they didn't work out very well. Whereas we play with safe words and um, there's a lot of aftercare, there's a lot of living going on. It's not... Uh, it's just it's it's just healthy and and, and good and, and you know emotionally uh, very filling. And I love what you said before too that the punishment instead of being punishment because someone is genuinely angry and emotionally upset with you that this is more reward based that it's you're taking uh, like punishment. My last, my last girlfriend, my last girlfriend, would just continually find things to be angry about, and. So it was just made up. She just wanted a reason to beat me up. And that was fine, but I could never really actually please her because she was always angry, so I was always insecure. Right. Whereas my girlfriend now, uh, she is uh, very rarely angry at me. Um, you know, she, be she hurts me because she loves me, and so I feel loved. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, so, and I feel... Like, I feel better looking than I felt before I was dating her. I feel more lovable and likable than I did before our relationship. And I know exactly you know, kind of like how you self -esteem feel. Thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And the and so you're basically you're taking the punishment as a type of love for her and it always comes across as a type of love. Right. So I feel loved and, and that's healthy. It absolutely. I, I, I'm just smiling and nodding. You can't see over the phone because uh, that's mm -hmm. exactly how I feel in scene and that's exactly why I do BDSM. Uh, do you want to, and is it just because you made reference to your childhood and sexuality, and uh, I want to mention that uh, Stephen has also written a book called Happy Baby, which some of you may be familiar with, and is that autobiographical? There's a lot of autobiograph autobiography in Happy Baby. I write, you know, I write my novels based on personal experiences. I'm not much of a fiction writer, <laughs> so I just, but, but there's also a lot of fiction in Happy Baby. It is, it is ultimately a, it's a novel, so based on my real experiences, but it's fiction. I have to say, that was incredibly painful to read. I finished reading it yesterday. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
and I wasn't sure how much I wanted to talk about it. It was really hard to read because the character in the novel uh, did go through group homes and horribly painful sexual and physical abuse. Mm -hmm. So was writing the novel, was this a type of, um, uh, what's the word I want to use, um, sort of getting that out of your system? Was it sort of a vindication for you? Well, you know, it's really, for me, it, it, I write it to communicate, and it helps me to be open about who I am and, and what my feelings are. Mm -hmm. So uh, it helps me a lot that way. It's very therapeutic for me to write, um, and I like to have my books read. Uh, certainly not for everyone. Or certainly, Happy Baby is very dark, and not everybody wants to read about that kind of stuff. And, and a lot of the S&M in Happy Baby is non-consensual, not safe and sane, you know, but which is not to say it's not erotic. I happen to think it's a very erotic book. But, uh, it's not it's not for everyone, certainly. And um, But the other thing about Happy Baby was that it was coming out of the closet for me. Like when Happy Baby came out, it was very obvious to everybody, my friends included, that I was really into S&M. You couldn't write a book like this and not be into it. So uh, all my friends who were vanilla and who were not in S&M now knew what I was into. It was really... Uh, that felt really good to be out of the closet that way. I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a strong proponent of people being sexually open. How did your friends react to this uh, revelation? How did they react to the book? Yeah, they had no problem with it at all. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> cared. You know, people think that, oh, God, people, everybody's going to judge me based on my sexuality. I mean, they made some dumb, off-color jokes that I didn't necessarily appreciate, <laughs> but... Uh, just because they didn't know any better, but that's not a big deal. And they were uh, they were supportive. They, nobody, I didn't lose any friends as a result. So oh, I don't right. uh, really have, I mean, my my, uh, my family's still alive. I don't really have any con I have much contact with them. I mean, I, I have contact with my old brother who is only 17. We don't really talk about that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I have an older sister who I don't see that often. Uh, and a third I don't talk at all. My father left bad reviews of the book on Amazon.com. I don't think he particularly liked the book. I think he thought it was disgusting, you know, but, but why would I care about that, you know? Yeah. You said you're not sure if you consider yourself poly or not. If you do decide to scene with other people and sort of become a little bit more poly, what do you think you'll get out mm -hmm. of it? Well, first off, I think scening with other people and being poly are not really the same thing. Right. Okay, yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, like, I mean, at least in, in, as I define that, and I know that there's no real, there's no one definition of polyamory. Yeah. Um, I think if uh, my girlfriend brings another woman into a scene, I don't think that makes us poly. I just think it makes us kinky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I both of, uh, which, both of which are good. I've, what do you say? <laughs> yeah, both of which are good. <laughs> if I have a so, um, so for example, I have an old friend in Ohio, and we've played before. And when I go back to Ohio, I would probably ask my girlfriend if she was okay with me doing S and M with uh, this other woman. S and M was before, but very lightly, and I'd imagine my girlfriend would not have a real problem with that. You know, fingers crossed. Um, is that really being poly? I don't really know that that is being poly. I kind of think that. To be poly would be to have another girlfriend, to be open, emotionally open to having a serious, committed relationship. Um, yeah. A little bit of non-monogamy, uh, a little bit of seeing other people without having uh, an emo the emotional connection of a relationship. I don't think it's poly. I think that I think a lot of people in the SNM community anyway would not consider that poly. That would just be have a scene with somebody else. Uh, I'm probably not going to, I can't really, I mean, with that one exception, my old friend in Ohio, I would probably, uh, yeah, I don't know if I'll be playing with anybody else, but it could happen. Like, I'm not closed off to the idea that if I met somebody and there was a connection, yeah. um, simply because, I, because that's an open thing because my girlfriend is open to it, and that's how far she is, and she is just a hardwired guy. Um, then I, I'm okay. I'm open to it, uh, but I'm not necessarily 
out looking for it, you know, um, I feel, uh, for one thing, I, I feel very emotionally and sexually satisfied right now. Well, and your relationship is also only four months old, too. So Right. We see each other a lot. Yeah, you've got all that new, the, what we call NRE, new relationship energy going on. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I think, but um, well, we also, we just spend so much time together. Um, I said, I mean, I wonder when she's back in school and, and I'm on other projects and we spend less time together, will I then start feeling like I, I need, I should be, will I then just be more open to seeing other people, uh, you know, emotionally and intellectually? And uh, I think it's quite possible that I will, um, which is not to say that I think my girlfriend's replaceable, but I just can imagine wanting that or being more open to that. Right now, it's it's hard, to, it's, kind of, it's kind of hard to uh, see stuff. I, mean, I see her 40 hours a week or something, and I don't have <laughs> enough time right now to see anybody else, you know. Time is definitely, time is definitely the biggest and scarcest resource in poly relationships, for sure. Yeah. And uh, my girlfriend is so, uh, she's so wonderful. You know, and so beautiful, and and mm. you know, intellectually, physically, and sexually, that it would almost it might it might be a disappointment to you, somebody else. It might be you know that I'm not Aww. that I'm used to a certain level now of of discourse and sexuality that I think would be hard to measure up to. That's I don't think so comes along that often. <laughs> That's so sweet. Mm-hmm. That's what I say too. I tell Gray Dancer that all the time. That. Uh, you know, the the level of communication that we've reached, the openness, the honesty, and quite frankly, the level of our BDSM play as well. I, I, I joke with him. He's like, why, you know, why haven't you found a lover in Chicago? And I'm like, well, you set the bar really high. <laughs> right. So, so it's not that I'm not open to it. It's just that, yeah, it's, it's not, maybe, maybe it's not so likely. And I don't, I don't know how much uh, my girlfriend is really looking, even though she's certainly hardwired a different way from me, which is she just has a lot of affection and is open to being affectionate with people. Um, but I think between me and her husband, and then she also does work as a professional dominatrix, so she sees people mm-hmm. uh, on that level. I don't know. She was, she's was been saying she doesn't really feel like she has enough time now to have another <laughs> person in her life. So... Um, yeah, so who knows? Who knows what will happen from here? So have and, the two you know, of you... Ever actually tried real polyamory on my end, you know, or but maybe just being with somebody that's polyamorous and is married, maybe that is being poly. That's Actually, that was a question I asked myself for a long time, because for a long time it was just, I was only seeing Grey Dancer, and he was engaged and then married, and I was like, well, am I poly? Am I not? If I'm sort of single, but yeah, that's actually an excellent question. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think that it's not, it's not poly just to have an S and M scene with somebody else when your girlfriend is comfortable with that and you've negotiated that. I don't really see that as poly, like one night of, of you know, semi non monogamy. Um, but I do kind of think that if you're dating somebody who is married and you're and you're comfortable and okay with them being poly, then that really is you being poly as well. So I think in that way I'm 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 poly because. Uh, so far, I'm okay with this, and, you know, my girlfriend tells me that you know, she's been doing this with him for nine years, and this is actually the first relationship since she's been with her husband that has gotten to this level, and she's incredibly attractive and, and incredibly, uh, you know, he's attractive in a lot of different ways. She meets people, and, and I think she dates a lot of people who think they can handle it, and, and they find out very quickly that they can't, mm-hmm. and so those people really aren't probably, so maybe I am. You know, because so far it's, it's been pretty smooth. Well, that's actually, it does it does require definitely a level of self-awareness. And obviously, I mean, in reading Happy Baby, you've got, you've obviously worked through a lot in your life in coming out as as kinky and as a submissive. Um, I wanted to ask you, oh, so have you and your girlfriend, have you yet negotiated either, obviously not a poly relationship, but have you negotiated BDSM scenes outside of, your own relationship yet? Uh, we've talked about them, but we haven't uh, 
we really, you know, we haven't really done anything with it. Okay. Um, I mean, she's she's talked about bringing somebody else into the scene. Hmm. So about about doing a scene with someone else. She's she's mentioned that she had a fantasy where we were both with another woman. Um, and I said, yeah, I've had that fantasy too. Oh, that's you know, awesome. fantasies with other women uh, tend to tend to revolve around my girlfriend also being in the room. Mm-hmm. Not very erotic to me unless she's there. So can I ask so, you... Uh, but then it becomes very erotic. So can I ask you, in your fantasy of being with a third woman, do you, are you submissive to the third woman as well? Yeah, I'm very submissive. <laughs> I don't have to get this switch. <laughs> <laughs> in my fantasy, it's often basically that that while another woman, that my girlfriend is holding me while another woman is doing something to me. Ooh. And then I'm leaving the comfort for my girlfriend, you know, while someone else is you know, having anal sex with me or, you know, burning me or doing something like that. And, uh, and yeah, and then, and then also somehow doing it for my girlfriend, you know, and I'm somehow making her proud for her. in this way. Oh. Yeah, uh, so that's where the fantasy tends to go. Maybe I'm just a romantic at heart. That, no, um, see, I understand. As a submissive, I get so much pride out of doing things and taking a certain level of pain and doing things mm-hmm. for my dom and my lover. And it's pride like yeah. I've never felt. I've never been. I've never felt so whole and so proud and so strong in my entire life as when I'm doing things right. for him. Yeah, me too. And I think, and the thing is, that for, for, you know, my girlfriend who doesn't, like, I'm like, like most of my friends are vanilla. My girlfriend, all of her friends are gay. She's mm-hmm. just been out for like, you know, 13 years or something, and she's just really been part of this community. And, you know, if and when there's a, a third person joins us for a scene, it's really going to be something that she's set up. She knows. Right. Uh, she knows a lot of women that would be interested in doing it, too. <laughs> um, and so uh, it'll just be when she decides to do it, then we'll do it. You know, she knows I'm she she knows I'm open to it. And will you write about it for us when you do? Because I'd really love to hear about that. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Well, you'll have to let me know if you do write about anything like that. And by the way, listeners, mm-hmm. I wanted to um, comment that uh, uh, Stephen was nice enough, kind enough to send me another uh, short story of a scene that he written that was sort of poly and BDSM friendly, and it was just the hottest thing I've ever read. And he's given me permission mm-hmm. to read it on the air in January, you said, once it's okay with the publisher? Yeah, yeah, January. So it was, oh, it was really hot, and I can't wait to read it on the air. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you'll let us know if and you're actually, right. Actually, it's, it's going to be, and that's going to be actually the anchor story of a book of erotica that I have coming out in September of next year. But which is called? Do you want to go ahead? I was going to ask you. That was my next question. As we wrap things up, do you have um, books, articles, anything coming out that you'd like to plug? Well, I have an anthology of original political fiction that comes out in January that I edited, and that's a fundraiser for um, for progressive candidates running in 2006. Okay. And, and that's called that's called stumbling and raging, more politically inspired fiction. And then I have a collection of my own erotica, which has been published uh, primarily on Nerve dot com, but also in some other places. Uh, and that collection <laughs> that collection is from Cleus Press in September of next year. And the title of that collection is uh, "My Girlfriend Comes to the City and Beats Me Up." My girlfriend comes to the city and beats me up. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty much it's like nine stories and they're pretty much all femme top you know, sub so it's not going to be for everybody but hopefully it'll be a, what people will consider a well written literary book on a specific subject well I think you'll find as a uh as you said that most of your friends are vanilla and her friends are kinky I think you'll find as you get more into the BDSM world that your vanilla to your ratio of vanilla to kinky friends will change <laughs> I hope so. I really, I want to know more kinky people, and I want to be more part of that world. And uh, and I slowly am becoming more part of that world, but it's just a process. I only started a few years ago. Well, I've only been in the scene for a couple of years, too, and now practically 
all of my I have to make efforts to hang out with my vanilla friends. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, anything? Yeah, it's nice. It's it's nice knowing other people that are seeing with me. Sometimes, like I'm, I'm not hanging out with my girlfriend. I want to just go somewhere where I can kind of be openly submissive, where I can sit on the floor, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and not necessarily play or anything, but just act like myself, you know. That, absolutely. Be nice. Yeah, or you can talk about, or you can talk about your girlfriend and her husband, or your girlfriend and the great scene you did last night, and they don't look at you like you're weird. Right, and it's not just shock value for their entertainment. It's not just some, some strange thing. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's true. I'm very fortunate that I have a group of friends that I can talk about the scene or whatever. And it's just like, oh, and they'll be like, oh, so, you know, he beat you and those are your bruises and uh, you ended up crying. That's great. Good for you. So what did you have for lunch yesterday? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know when, when she, I know when you, when she, when she cuts, you know, when she cuts my back and, and, you know, when we do all this cutting stuff and I want to show people these cuts. Mm -hmm. she's done and, and how look she's cut of these beautiful intricate things into my back and I don't have enough friends that I can do that with oh. you know sometimes I show my vanilla friends <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can't show the vanilla people that because even the most open-minded of vanilla people it's it's really easy to be squicked by that and I don't want to put anyone down it's just um, you know, some people are going to be squicked by seeing the cutting lines. I was at first, actually, because it's not, I'm afraid of knives. But I see how at, happy at it... first, right? Yeah. Well, I see how happy it makes my friends. A lot of my friends are into cutting. And I see, I've seen them seen, and I see how happy it makes them and how it gets them into subspace mentally, just as it does if I'm getting a flogging. So I've got to a place where it I'm... It makes like, me, yeah. when my girlfriend cuts me, it makes me feel so incredibly beautiful. Oh. You know? Oh, that's one. I hate that we're just getting into the really good stuff now, and we're like thirty minutes in. This always happens. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I know. Um, at well, obviously you get. Well, actually, why don't? Why the hell not? I can cut this up into two interviews. Um, what do you get out of BDSM? How does it make you feel when you're in scene? Well, it makes me feel with the with the right person. Uh, it makes me feel really safe mm -hmm. and and uh, loved, and and I tend. You know, people tend to go places when they're in scene, and I tend to go to a place that's very young mm. and become very childlike, and so I kind of replace uh, my childhood, which was a childhood, frankly, filled with danger and violence, and uh, and not being safe or protected by anyone, <laughs> and it replace it with a new childhood where I uh, have a space to be a child and where I do feel safe and protected. That sounds wonderful. It sounds wonderful. Yeah, and, uh, and then I also uh, had a, had problems when I was younger feeling very attractive, and so uh, this when my girlfriend is topping me and when she cuts me, um, it makes me feel very attractive. Like it makes me feel desired. Mm. You know. Yeah, I do. And so, like when when I when when I have marks when I have you know, cuts because she's been hitting me with a cane, you know, or I'm just red from something that she's done, mm -hmm. you know, then, uh, you know, I just feel beautiful. And then when she, when she carved these intricate uh, wing patterns in my back, which is what she did before oh. uh, Folsom Street, and, um, you know, I just felt, like, I felt so beautiful. I felt like the most beautiful desirable thing, you know, and, uh, yeah, I don't know why I feel that way, <laughs> why it makes me feel that way, uh, and I'm sure it's just different for everyone, if, you know, what, what they need or what makes them feel, gives them this feeling, but that's, you know, certainly how I felt. I do. It was nice. I, I do absolutely know that feeling of being desirable, and I, I, I know in my case, a lot of it has to do with um, attention that someone is caring that much to, because you can't do a scene like that and be focused on something else to have someone absolutely be that focused on me and my skin and my pain and my screams and you know everything that I am including you know all the I mean in your case it would be your childhood issues and in my case I mean I have you know all kinds of issues too that I work out through BDSM 
Um, mm -hmm. I mean, my big, I didn't really, I had no childhood abuse, um, but I definitely have issues with abandonment because my parents would just sort of ignore us and walk away from us a lot. So for me, having somebody that focused on me, I mean, having somebody punishing me, I'm like you, I, I, I'm not into the cutting, but um, I love showing my bruises to people because it just, it's marks for days and weeks after the scene showing you know, that he is still there, that his attention and his love and his mm -hmm. marks are still on me, you know, even, you know, days and weeks after the scene. And it just makes me feel so incredibly loved and included and in this wonderful family of people who care about me. Like I never really had, my family wasn't very affectionate. There was no abuse, but there was no affection either. And it's having those marks and just feeling mm -hmm. attached to someone even days after is incredible. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah, totally. I love being marked. Being marked feel uh, very warm. So. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and I'm so jealous too. Actually, that you've got to go to Folsom Street. I've decided that I absolutely have to go next year. Oh, <laughs> because it's so everybody good to see I know it's my first time going there on someone's leash. Mm -hmm. So being mm -hmm. looking at her leash was just uh, just awesome. Mm. And everybody I know is there too. I mean, everybody in the BDSM and poly and kink world is out. So next year, definitely. Next year, I'll see you there. <laughs> is there anything else you wanted to say or plug before I let you go? No, I think I've, I think I've plugged it all. You know, <laughs> we always make that plug sound so kinky when we say it. Uh -huh. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for taking the time to share your story and your thoughts on Polly and BDSM with our listeners today. Great. And as soon as the uh, books thanks in, for having me. Thank you. And as soon as those books come out, we will provide links to them in the show notes. Great. And you can, you know, provide links to uh, Happy Baby right now. Absolutely. And Happy Baby <laughs> is available right now. I'll provide a link to that in Amazon.com. And thanks again to Stephen Elliott for taking the time to talk with me. It was such a pleasure to talk with him and uh, definitely coming from new to Polly, but not new to BDSM. So that was definitely a very interesting perspective. And his book, once again, Happy Baby, is available at Amazon.com. Well, I think that about wraps it up for our show today. Now yeah, that's it. Oh, right. Questions, comments, feedback. Email me, cunningminx, C-U-N-N-I-N-G-M-I-N-X at gmail.com. Or why not call the listener comment line, area code 206-600-5677. And remember, guys, sometimes it's all about the sex. <laughs>